Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for our last session of the day and what a day it has been from 9 a.m. We've been here uh, bringing everyone some really interesting panels and one-on-one -on -one discussions from uh, our new friend Jay Rowe at HBO to a really great diversity panel uh, featuring our friend Gloria Fan, uh, who is now with uh, Disney Television, as well as uh, Boone Salim with Day Zero, Trevor Noah's company. We heard from them today. We heard from our fellow writers from Karen Hall, uh, uh, who's one of the top screenwriters and showrunners in LA. We also had our treatment panel, so many amazing things, but I am so excited for this panel in particular. Uh, this is gonna be a really fun conversation to kind of wrap up our day here uh, at the Miami Media and Film Market's 11th edition. Uh, of course, we always wanna give a shout out to all of our sponsors and partners. Uh, Patty Arias, you're doing a, such an amazing work with the rest of the team here, getting everything going as our executive producer. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you, Joe Chi, thank you, Chemical. Uh, thank you everyone on our technical teams uh, and all of our partners that make this possible. Uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce our very special guest here. Uh, this is Building Braun, a conversation with Brenda Gilbert, who is the co-founder and president of Braun Media Corporation. Uh, Brenda leads an executive team that oversees and manages all of the company's worldwide initiatives. Uh, the Vancouver-based parent company, they have offices in LA, New York, London, Toronto. They operate global divisions, including Braun Studios, Braun Creative, Braun Animation, uh, Braun Releasing, Braun Digital, and Braun Life. Uh, their films include Fences, Joker, Bombshell, Judas and the Black Messiah. They've received a grand total of 27 Academy Award nominations, six Academy Award wins, and counting, I'm sure. Uh, so this is just going to be a really fun chat uh, with Brenda Gilbert. So let's bring Brenda into the show. Hi, Brenda. Hey, how are you, JL? I'm good. I'm good. It's been a very interesting, our first virtual conference. I think we talked about that. And it's been, it's been an interesting day, but it's been great so far. Wonderful. Good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we want to just kind of jump right into it and let's just begin with a brief intro. Um, you know, uh, so many of our audience members have heard of Braun so much, especially in the recent years. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where are you from originally and how did you first sort of get started in the business? Well, first of all, I want to thank you and um, Miami Media and Film Market for having me here. It's honestly a great, great honor, a great pleasure. Uh, very humbled by the invitation, and also thank you to Helena McKenzie from Film London who made the introduction. So, um, in terms of you know going back to the I guess the backstory of Braun is little did I know that I would be you know at the helm um, co-founding a company alongside my husband Aaron. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, production, a production company, um, and and making movies, whether that's live action, narrative, non scripted, um, an animated series. Um, so if we go way back when, just in terms of where I grew up, I grew up in Canada. Uh, I was born and raised here, and thought maybe possibly I'd go into fashion design because I, I loved, yeah, I loved I loved design, mm. and, and I and. Um, um, I was discouraged at a very young age not to do it and go on the business route because apparently I had I had good grades. I was not a straight A student, but I was an honor roll student. So went to school for business. And what's interesting about sort of my endeavor um, at, at the post secondary level was that my electives were organizational behavior and human resources. You know, lo and behold, not knowing that I would be owning a company, you know, with multiple arms um, globally. So. Um, I met my husband when I was working for essentially a merchant bank. So our specialty was finance, um, emerges and acquisitions and financing. And um, my husband was a client there. Um, he, he, uh, we had in-house legal counsel, but our lawyer had his own clientele as well. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time my husband um, had his own music business, so music licensing for film, music supervision for film, his own catalog. Um, and fast forward a few years is that we incorporated a company called Broad Management, and if you can believe it, 1999. And that was the company that we consulted through and essentially got paid through. And mm -hmm. um, um, at one point in time, because my husband has a knack for deal making and financing, one of his friends who he had helped previous to even us knowing each other asked if he could help out with some gap financing. And we had also produced um, a, a, a live action film is, is we decided to open up shop as a studio with only a handful of individuals. 
And this started off in our home. Um, wow. Then we moved on to 500 square feet of space again with just a handful of, uh, of crew members and employees, and then moved to 1,500, 3,000. Um, and then we found a building that could accommodate um, our expansion because we decided that we really wanted to do animation in-house um, because the production pipeline uh, at that particular time using the technicalities or the te technical gear um, software, hardware, etc., was a, more of a long, a longer process. Um, so yeah, so we built out um, in our Burnaby, uh, British Columbia studios. For those who don't know where Burnaby is, it's about 30 minutes east of downtown proper. And so we expanded that particular um, building to outfit our animation primarily. Um, mm. And 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 so um, it sort of went in in side by side in terms of the live action productions that we were doing um, to the animation. But when you look at animation and look at the old production pipeline, we were literally churning out whether it was us taking a lead producer role or executive producing productions. We we're churning out about twenty five to one in terms of a ratio to to animation wow. to live action. Yeah. Wow. Um, so we're mostly animation at that point. It was, it was, it was most, no, no, it was mostly live action to animation. Ah, okay. The production pipeline was that much longer. Right. Um, yeah. So it was a little bit different back in the day um, because of the technology. We're using different technology right now. We launched a company last year called Braun Digital. So premium animated series with the help of Epic Games and its Unreal Game Engine. So we're working on, we're in post on two animated um, projects. Uh, and then we're a third one that we're going to be starting on soon. Wow. Yeah. And uh, you actually plugged our conference tomorrow because we're going to have uh, one of uh, Jason Chen from Braun Digital speaking with, as you mentioned, Helena and Adrian uh, about their animation strategy. So that's going to be a fun day tomorrow uh, as well. But, uh, you know, it's just it's, it's incredible to see everything that you're involved in now as a company, as producers and how you said it just really started as a home business and as a consulting company. Right all those years ago and that just kind of morphed and kept evolving over the years. And so, you know, just sort of just going after where you started and mentioning at one point going into fashion and then getting into finance and banking. Um, at what point did you guys think, you know, you could give, you could make this run at a production company in a studio. What kind of was that spark that said, no, let's, let's try this. Let's go for it. I think it was just the ability of going through one production, live action production, and also, you know, um, um, being able to finance my husband, raising the financing for particular projects as well as a consultant, um, really led the helm. But again, and I must emphasize is, I didn't realize that we would be running, you know, the Braun group of companies and multiple productions. Um, and then, you know, also expanding into TV. It wasn't something that I said, okay, I'm going to go and do it. Like a lot of filmmakers do where they know exactly what they want to do. How do they want to go about and doing it? And they actually make the move to, you know, either Los Angeles or New York to do it. We, you know, we, we do work around the world. Um, but our residence is in Vancouver. Hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's amazing how you can kind of keep your sort of hub there, but then just kind of work all over the world. And I think what we've been learning today through several panels is how global this industry has become, right? Uh, it feels much more decentralized. So maybe you technically don't have to be in the traditional media hubs of LA and New York, right? I, I think so. The, the reason we have an office in LA is because, you know, most of the major studios and agencies are in Los Angeles and we have, a, 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 you know, a lot of employees there as well. Um, but as we know, and what we've learned in the past year and a half is virtual production is a real thing. And also being able to attract um, individuals, you know, very, very talented creatives, artists globally. Um, mm. So even with our Braun Digital um, group that's led by Jason Chen, we have individuals from Europe, from, you know, Canada, the US, India, from Mexico. Um, so it's, it's, it's really interesting to have all these individuals, these creatives that also bring different artistry, different perspectives, uh, you know, makes the project that much more rich and full. Yes. And, and I know that, you know, you guys are very much driven by the directors, the filmmakers, the auteurs. Let's talk a little bit about your development process and we'll, you know, focus obviously on live action. Uh, you know, as a studio, as a company, what are you looking for? 
in, in something that you would like to develop or with an artist or filmmaker you'd like to work with? I think it's first it starts with the story. Um, is there emotional connectivity to the story? Is it something, is it a topic that can resonate with audiences globally? And is there an emotional connectivity to it as well? Because the, the essence to all the content that we produce in, in um, you know, film and TV is that it's not just only to start a conversation, but to continue that conversation beyond the medium that it's consumed. Is it something mm -hmm. that can be socially impactful? Can it invoke creative thinking? Can it also propel people to become change agents? So we really look at you know all aspects and also something that's not so cookie cutter. What is unique about this particular project? Um, you know what has been looked at and never done before in a very mm -hmm. unique way. Um, so, you know, those are the types of things that we look, look for. And obviously just in terms of a pitch from a particular filmmaker is how methodical and thoughtful are they with their pitch? Have they done the research? Have they done the research on Braun in terms of our catalog and what we've done before? And some of the filmmakers we've also worked with before, um, you know, giving many opportunities to individuals you know, directorial de debuts like Dev Patel, you know, right. making like a Nia DaCosta on Candyman, um, you know, had her opportunity as well. And whether we take a lead um, producer or role or whether we're an executive producer, because we do have that financing arm, is we want to make sure that it really supports what we believe in at Braun in terms of diversity, inclusivity, and collaboration. Wow. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's incredible. And it sounds like the, the ideal place for a filmmaker to want to work uh, because you touched on so many things, right? From finding this international audience to something that can go beyond the screen, which is, I think, very interesting, you know, especially with something socially driven, if something can spark a conversation, uh, you know, that's, that's bigger than the film itself. I think it's so important and so timely now, right? Because I feel like the world is changing so quickly. And, and we're living in a time now where I believe the world is smaller than ever, primarily because of technology and the way we're connecting right now. Uh, and so I think that's, that's fantastic and sort of how you approach that part of your work. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, obviously success means so many different things to so many different people. But I want to know, you know, what that means to you personally and to the company. Obviously, you've, I, I rattled off some stuff from your bio, but I don't think it even does justice to all the amazing work you've done over the last 10 years. So, but what, personally to you, Brenda, what, what is a success? What do you see as a success? Well, and, and, you're, and you're right, Jill, when you say that success means so many different things to people because it's the subjectivity of what is success. What drives mm -hmm. you? What motivates you? What are you impassioned by? Um, what do you want to show the world? Um, and and for me is is that you know some of the things we already touched on in this conversation, but also to give people opportunities. Mm -hmm. We at Broad have a filmmaker first approach, you know, on a lot of things that we do, and we also a lot of filmmakers come to us because we give them creative independence, obviously with guidance and support, because we also have in-house legal business affairs, finance and post-production departments as well. So mm. there's, it's, it's, it's multifaceted just in terms of the support, not just necessarily from a creative aspect, but also, you know, what are the financial implications of some of these choices that creatives make, right? Which they may not necessarily understand. So we can help, you know, in the educational process in terms of film production from the financial and the, in the legal and business affairs side of things. Um, success to me is educating, enlightening, um, and also entertaining people. Success mm. to me is to continue to accord people opportunities, both within Braun. A lot of um, executives within Braun started off with us a few years ago and are now, you know, producers and getting EP credits. Right. Um, you know, a lot of individuals are now sort of helming their own departments and taking leadership roles, um, not just, you know, within Braun projects, but globally with our projects as well. Um, I think success to me is showing real change. If there are people that look like me and you, varying shades, you know, looking at the API communities, looking at the BIPOC communities, mm -hmm. um, that that is that is real change. Not necessarily on screen only, but behind mm -hmm. behind the scenes as well. 
Right. How can I help? Under Braun Life, which is our non-scripted label of the company, um, we have a black and brown incubators program where we champion and are supporting a lot of content providers there. Um, that particular um, initiative is championed and supported and led by Cassandra Butcher, who's our chief marketing officer, um, wow. along with James Carroll and China Martin. So success to me is quite candidly, if we all succeed, if we all can, you know, band our hands together or link our arms together and support one another. It's not a competition, it's a collaboration. Um, mm -hmm. And I would just like to see more people um, winning and more people being part of what we're doing. I think that's, I mean, it's, it's a great answer. And, and again, I think all the filmmakers, the audience are like, my God, what, why did a studio like this not exist before? But it's, I love the holistic approach to what you're saying, not only from a creative standpoint, but educating the filmmakers on budget, on production, on post, on how the whole process kind of works. Uh, and being able to do a lot of that in-house, including business and legal affairs. You know, uh, I think that that's that's incredible, you know, uh, an opportunity in terms of the, the vast amount of toolkits that your company provides, you know, in terms of a film and a filmmaker and a production. Uh, and so, you know, I think a lot of what you're saying, too, is something that we've been, again, talking about throughout the day is about, you know, the way that things used to traditionally been done in Hollywood, where it seemed like it was a closed wall. Right. It's like you're mm -hmm. trying to get inside these gates and there are all these gatekeepers and you're constantly be being told no. Uh, and we were having a great conversation in our diversity panel about let's find a way to say yes and figure it out. Instead of being the no people, let's be the coaches. Let's be the people in the room that say, look, this may not be ready for us yet, but you know, I see something in you and I can help you get there. Um, and it may not be on this project or the one after that or the one after that, but you know, I think this idea of collaboration and this idea of everybody wins versus the old, like, this is all for me or, or, you know, all or nothing kind of thing. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And, and something that I also try to support and champion as well is so if a particular project is pitched to us and it's not necessarily for us and not because of the content itself or the filmmakers, um, it's just the bandwidth as well, because we literally across a broad group of companies probably have close to a hundred projects in development right now. So, wow. What I try to do is make sure that people are able to maybe um, look into the resources within the, the company. So if I have a production executive that can possibly give them a few tips and spend you know, a few minutes with a particular individual, or maybe it's a development executive, or maybe it's even somebody on the animation side of things that can mm. go through the Unreal Game Engine, which is a new technology, and, yeah. and just walk them through it, and, and, and it can be downloadable for free, you know, why can't we take that two minutes to do that? It really doesn't take anything but your time. And mm -hmm. if I can do it, anybody can do it just in terms of making a reference or a referral, or even one of my colleagues within the industry that would be more than happy to help in some capacity. Right, right. And, and yeah, I think it's going back to that sort of apprenticeship model, right? Uh, where you kind of learn by doing and you know you touched on this gaming engine and the fact that technology is accelerating so quickly and there's so many positions that need to be filled throughout this pipeline now right uh, particularly in the animation space and having this mindset to say okay let's train that next generation so that they can also be part of the filmmaking process absolutely you know the next generation but we also have to look at one thing that i've been thinking about a little bit is also ageism is a lot mm. of times people want an opportunity and either they're too experienced or not experienced enough to fit a certain role. So how do we also help mm. those individuals that have been in the industry for decades and have not been accorded an opportunity in some capacity? Wow. And that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's brilliant, you know, and, and you talk about age and diversity and kind of expanding a little bit and folks that have been in the grind for so many years and just have struggled to get that opportunity. Uh, and so do you um, do you take any sort of preference over, you know, uh, let's say, you know, voices from communities that haven't had a voice thus far? And is that would you say that's towards the top of your priority list or are you just looking for a great story and a great filmmaker to work with? And then you just kind of take it from there. I think all of the above jail, because there are great filmmakers that haven't been accorded an opportunity or given an opportunity before that, you know, are, are from different types of communities that are not well represented traditionally. If we even look at, you know, award shows 
um, and things like that, you know, even just the uproar in terms of the actors, um, you know, that aren't um, getting nominated. So if you don't have a pool of individuals that um, can win awards, then we're not doing our work or we haven't done enough work. Um, and to also to address a comment that you made earlier is, you know, a lot of times we're told no and it hasn't been done before. And to me, it's like, okay, well, let's do something about it. And, and mm -hmm. there is definitely strength in numbers. You know, I'm one of many individuals and we have to find each other. And, and, um, and, and I think that's, that's the way that we can go about and doing things. So in terms of, you know, the type of content we look for, you know, the story first, but there's a number of people that have not been, you know, given the opportunities to really shine and to really rise and to really, you know, voice their talent in a way like never before. Mm. No, that's yeah. You're absolutely right about that, and I think you know, giving sort of the trajectory of your company, I feel that obviously you're in a position now to be so such an important role and a part in in creating these sort of future storytellers and artists and voices that may have not had the opportunity otherwise. And I think that's that's incredible. Uh, and so I, I want to talk a little bit now, you know, obviously about. Um, sort of some of the breakthroughs of what you've done as a producer and as part of Braun. Uh, what would you say thus far has been one of the biggest breakthroughs as a company that you've had to this point? And I know you have a lot of verticals, but you know, what would you say is one of the biggest things, something that you can say, man, this is when we really felt we got to the other side of things, perhaps. When um, Viola Davis accepted her award. <laughs> for the Oscars Absolutely. and mentioned our, our company name. This is a global audience and you're just like, ah! <laughs> I think for, for us, my husband and I were actually at the Oscars. So oh it was that, you know, alongside with um, some of the co-producing partners on that show. So we were executive producers. It was just like, are we really here? Did she actually mm. just say we're on? Um, and it was just, it actually, I, I felt put us on the map. We had a lot of people reaching out to us and pitching their shows and things like that, or even congratulating us, which was, which is so humbling and, and, and so, so great. So I think that was definitely one of our breakthroughs. Um, I think for, for me personally, um, is, you know, producing the animated show Willoughby's, which was mm. quite the long trek. Um, right. and that was with, with not was wasn't just with me, my husband obviously, um, and and Luke Carroll who was a, a key contributor. Um, mm -hmm. We had a wonderful crew, so really being supported. So we can't have these breakthroughs unless we're supported, you know, well by our crew, by our colleagues, by our executives at Ron, um, and also Netflix was incredibly supportive in terms of helping us every step of the way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and that's key as well. I think also is that having confidence in what you're doing and the content that you're putting out there, um, you know, Judas and the Black Messiah said a lot in terms of you know, the racial reckoning that we all were feeling, um, you know, during a pandemic where nobody was going anywhere. So we had, we, we couldn't avoid some of these difficult conversations or things that have been happening for hundreds of years. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was just really important. So these, these nominations along with our studio partnerships and, and, and wins, uh, mm. have been so prolific for us because it just keeps pushing us into the direction that we want to, but also realizing we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and like you said, I think for it, uh, a good producer, it's all about what's next, right? You know, uh, you know, despite all the successes and all the struggles, I think you're always thinking ahead. Uh, and so what, knowing how much you guys are involved in between studios, between animation, between your financing arm, um, where would you like to see the company 10 years from now? I know that this edition, we talked about your 10 years and now your next 10 years, where, where would you like to see Braun 10 years from now? I think it's, it's still giving people opportunities, um, first and foremost, internally and externally. Uh, also making sure that there's social impact, um, that we have line, uh, line items created in our budgets for social impact as opposed mm. to being an afterthought or also, you know, net proceeds go to particular projects. I also uh, want to make sure that, you know, our content has an extension of its lifespan. So mm. what I mean by that is looking at, 
you know, other ways that we can put content out there, whether it's gaming, whether it's, you know, the merchandising, the, the music that can be so impactful just in terms of the lyrics themselves, the artists, you know, amplifying artists also that are emerging, musical artists. So that's what the next 10 years are, is just keep pushing, putting great content out there, but really thinking about our content just in terms of much more of a franchise, um, because there is longevity with franchises and also to meet, you know, and to seek global audiences and also all age groups. Right. Wow. That's that's very ambitious. But I, I you know, considering everything that you've done, I know that you're going to do that and more. Uh, and so, you know, some folks have had questions because we see bronze so much now in so many different titles. And you've mentioned, talked a little bit about the difference between when you're involved in a, a sort of a producerial role or you take a step back as an EP, um, you know, just to explain to our audience, what is the difference between the two? So for example, a project uh, as a case study where you were more involved versus one where you were more of an EP uh, and uh, involved more on the financing side. Um, usually when you take a lead producer role, you're involved in lots of things. Sometimes when the book is optioned, you know, you deal with that, you deal with all the contract negotiations of talent, et cetera. You're part of all the locations, so all the day to day, you're also responsible for delivering a particular show as well. So you have much more of a hands-on involvement when you're a producer, um, and you live and breathe that particular project as an EP. Um, you can have somewhat of a creative role and you see some of the dailies. Um, for us, it's been a financial role where we contributed financially to particular projects. We have um, slate deals with a lot of the studios, including MGM and Warner Brothers. So mm -hmm. for instance, on, on Joker, we weren't involved with day to day. Um, but with say, for instance, um, the Willoughby's, we were there day to day. We, uh, the production was done in, on site in our in our facility in, in Burnaby, British Columbia, and in, in other places as well. Mm, okay, no, that's that's fantastic. And so uh, we have so many questions coming in, and I know that we were going to save them, but I'm just kind of like throw a few in, if you don't mind, uh, just so we can get try to get through some of these. But uh, Javier, who's a local filmmaker here, he asked, uh, does Braun acquire completed animated features or do you prefer to do all the animation in-house? So Javier, so far, because we've actually changed our direction a little bit and, and um, launched Braun Digital. So we're um, working on premium animated series using the Unreal Game Engine with Epic Games support. Um, we've been developing everything in-house so far. Mm. Okay, so there you go, Javier. It's all in-house for now. <laughs> for now, I always, yes. say, I always say TBD, to be continued or to be, you know, announced. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I want to see bronze sales, bronze distribution, bronze everything. <laughs> well, but, we, do have, we do have a company called Braun Releasing, which um, is our sales arm of the company. Okay, so there you go. My wish just yeah. came through. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even know it. You didn't even have to blow out a birthday candle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, okay, so uh, in terms of, um, yeah, so there's another question here from Rita um, who says, how does the Braun franchise work? Um, so I'm assuming that she's uh, referring to the, the, this idea of franchising a piece of content, perhaps. Um, you know, so if you can just kind of give sort of a, just a quick overview in terms of what do you see as a franchise or something that's franchisable, let's call it. Yeah. So, um, in terms of Braun Digital, so that's our, um, animated side of the things. So we're working on a, we we're in post on a, um, a production called Fables that's based on, uh, Aesop's, um, Fables, but it's a modern rendition like the tortoise and the hare. Mm. Um, looking at that how can you repurpose it for games, right? So it's not just content that people are consuming on a screen of some sort, is how can you repurpose it for games? How can you look at some of the ancillary, which is the merchandising of it? How can you look at maybe some music incorporation of it? Um, the merchandising can not just only be t-shirts, but it could be mugs or toys or things like that, or mm -hmm. games, you know, like tangible games of some sort. So really thinking about things from not just, you know, um, looking at something at a theater or on a screen, it's also what else can you do beyond that? Mm. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. And it's something that, um, you know, the industry wasn't thinking so much. I keep remembering the story, right? When 
George Lucas first launched the Star Wars franchise, for example, right? And Fox, they didn't care about the merchandising and the toys, and they basically let them have all. They just wanted the movie, you know, and they figured they were going to monetize that for three to six months, and they're on to the next thing. And lo and yeah. behold, you know, based on holding on to that one IP, to that one franchise, um, the world that he was able to create from that, right? So can something like that happen now or have studios and distributors and the big media companies, whether it's one or Disney gotten so savvy about that, that they'll try to take those rights early on. I think it's how you develop your particular project and the content around it and all the assets, right? So if you can repurpose the assets in some capacity and it has not to be an afterthought, it has to be a forethought in terms of how you're putting things together, whether mm. that's the character, whether that's even the environments, I'm talking strictly about animation, mm. um, you know, that I think that's what you have to think about is, you know, think about things ahead of time as opposed to afterwards when you go to pitch to a particular streamer or a network because they will, you know, they, they, they will take the property and then you're like, oh, I should have thought about this and thought about the other thing. Um, but then it's too late. Right, right. No, absolutely. Yeah. It's, and I think that goes back to, you know, you even mentioning business affairs and legal, right? And what goes into a contract and how, you know, that is meant to protect the company, but also the artist. Um, and I think what we're seeing now, especially because of the pandemic and how distribution is changing and how, you know, some of these content and artist deals are changing too, because we can't just bank on theatrical, even the A-list stars are starting to realize that they mm -hmm. can't just bet on that. And so that you're thinking about multiple verticals at the same time, right? Absolutely. You have to adapt and you have to be pivot and you have to be more creative in terms of what you're wanting to do. I mean, who knew that we'd be in a pandemic, right? And virtual right. production is the only type of production initially that everybody was able to move forward on. And even right now, just in terms of production, it gets a bit tricky, dependent upon the region, the country, the province, the state, uh, and the numbers, you know, the COVID numbers there, but also the various restrictions that involve, right, that are involved with that. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And that's obviously the main reason why we're doing this and we're not hanging out at the Biltmore right now, right? <laughs> next, next year, I'm optimistic, next year. Yes, yes, we are. And, and you're invited already. So that invitation is already out for June of 2022. <laughs> I look Ab forward to it. <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, just kind of like making the segue, you know, down to Miami because, you know, a lot of our filmmaking base, you know, is, is from here, um, you know, Miami and Florida, I, I, we've talked a little bit about this in our pre-chats, you know, I feel there's a lot of creative talent here. We've had certain breakthroughs. I think Moonlight is top of mind for a lot of mm -hmm. folks from our community and what that movie and that's been able to do for not only the filmmakers involved, you know, uh, uh, Terrell and Barry and, and their whole team, but also for our community. So, you know, what advice would you give for the next Barry Jenkins to Terrell McCraney that's working on that little indie script here in the suburbs of Miami? Well, there's a couple of things is, you know, I'm I'm from Vancouver um, and not from L.A. and not from New York. And I never went formally to through um, film school. Not that I recommend not doing that um, right. because it's, it's a lot harder not sort of having that background and learning everything on the fly um, is I think that for for any filmmaker, anybody in this industry, I call it the four P's is, you know, if you have the passion, the first P obviously being passion is that. If you have the passion for filmmaking um, and the artistry and the content and what you can do, um, you know, keep at it. If you have purpose and your purpose is to tell stories in a unique and compelling way, third P is patience and the fourth P is perseverance. Keep at it. Um, it took me to be, you know, to over 20, 25 years to be an overnight success. Uh, and we also know success is subjective, as I alluded to earlier. So it's, 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 it's really keeping at it, doing the work, doing the research, finding your community, your, you know, film industry community, learning from them, looking at different platforms, whether that's um, a clubhouse or online communities to really help uh, you with your questions and give you guidance and provide you with resources. Um, and it's easier to do now than it ever has been before, because there's a lot of people that have been putting together, um, you know, um, uh, resource materials on Clubhouse. They have different rooms where you can ask questions very candidly. It's very informational, more so than ever before. So uh, all I say is, you know, 
keep at it. Um, I didn't know that I was going to be here and 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 doing you know you know JL reaching out to me and saying let's have a conversation <laughs> about Braun. So mm -hmm. um, you know anything can happen. The sky's the limit. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And and again, as you mentioned earlier, you know, for Helena hooking us up and you know being this Miami conference, but then somehow our relationship with the UK led us to you back to Miami. So it's really amazing how this is really a global community, but I still see it as a very closely knit one, right? And I think th those are in it for the reasons that you mentioned, especially those four Ps, share a sort of kindred spirit regardless of where we're from. Exactly, exactly. It's a real sense of community, our film industry, and you find really like-minded, supportive people, all the better, and there is strength in numbers. Yeah, I agree. And so uh, speaking of which, I want to just jump to a couple of questions and then we'll come back here. Um, so this question, you know, speaking about international. Hi, Brenda, would Braun be open to co-pros in Thailand, Thailand in a brand new state of the art studio with international partners? So something about a studio in Thailand. Um, how open are you guys to working in that part of the world? I, th I think, you know, you always have to take a step back and, and be open to all sorts of opportunities and expanding your reach just in terms of the content that you want to provide. Um, you know, and also given we, I have to make sure that there's the bandwidth within Braun because there's a lot of things that we're doing across the Braun group of companies, including um, our investment and advisory arm of the company called Braun Ventures. So we have 12 different companies on, on that side of things, too. So um, I think, you know, for us as a company, and moving forward, always being open, regardless of where um, a particular production company is or where a studio is. Um, but I always say is make sure that if you are going to be presenting materials, be thorough, be very methodical in terms of what are you trying to, you know, pitch to us? What are you trying to present to us? Mm -hmm. um, um, and if you have, you know, one year, two year, five year plan, what does that look like? Are you pitching us content? Um, and also is, you know, talking a little bit about some of the stakeholders within the studio space itself. Okay. Well, I think that thoroughly answers that. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, speaking about bandwidth, and this is something that I had mentioned in some of the talking points, but, you know, with all you have going on, how do you manage your this career that takes you everywhere with so many offices, so many employees, so many things going on with your personal life? Like, how how is that even possible? Um, uh, I used to travel quite a bit um, the past year and a half, haven't been traveling as much as the balance is, is, you know, staying connected to my children. I have three children, so I have a 20 year old, a 17 year old and a 12 year old who are very important to me and to my heart. Uh, and I know JL, you have three children, so you understand exactly where I'm coming from. Um, that's what keeps me grounded. That's what keeps me humble. That was, that's who keeps me true to me um, mm. because they're not afraid to give me very candid feedback either. Um, <laughs> even when I'm away, I talk to them every single day, twice a day, um, FaceTime with them every single day, just about, you know, the quirky things in life, whether, you know, they didn't get a teacher that they were hoping to get for a particular subject or if the dog was running off and doing something silly. So, you know, the way that I mix things in is that, Family is always first to me and foremost. Um, and then the business aspects, obviously, I prioritize according to, you know, what are the deadlines, what are the quotes and the bids and things like that that are needed on a weekly, daily basis. And also, you know, reaching out to um, our Braun family, which is really important to me as well. So um, in the midst of the pandemic, I did have a Zoom call with almost every single one of our employees. It was under 100 at the time right. because... It takes more than a village to do what we're doing across the Braun group of companies and every individual, whether they're the janitor, whether they're a production assistant, whether they're the COO of, of our company contributes, you know, significantly to everything that we're doing. Uh, mm. We are as only as good as all of us together. You know, it's so funny because, and, and like I said, you were, I don't know if you saw that panel, but it's funny that came up again. And I, there was this quote, like, it takes a village to raise a child. And I said, I think it takes a village to raise a filmmaker. As well. yeah. <laughs> and so you talk about your personal fame, but also your work family as well in that sense, um, where I feel this sort of like patriarchal, matriarchal, like it feels like very kind of homey and how uh, it seems like even in your workspace, everyone feels like they're part of a family or something, uh, something a bit more personal, right? 
we're we're trying, you know, we're trying to, and it wasn't it wasn't like intentional, like oh, we're set, we're going to set our, ourselves to be something a little bit different than all the other studios or all the other individuals. Is you know, bureaucracy is something that I don't necessarily like. I don't like mm. the politics. Um, um, even when I was uh, up to about forty eight employees, I was doing all of the human resources. Um, so wow. that's between yeah, hiring and you know, contract negotiations and benefits and stuff like that is one of the things that I told um, individuals that I was pre-screening for particular job positions was that please leave your egos at the door. Um, you know, I, of course, your expertise, your experience, your CV, your resume has brought you to us and, you know, me and you having this conversation. But the reality is there's no place for egos at Braun. Mm. Yeah. And, and that's interesting considering you work in the film industry. <laughs> well, you can tell I'm totally arrogant and egotistical, right? Absolutely. Jam? Yes. Yes. I can't even take it. No. Um, <laughs> you're like the anti all of that, which is amazing and such a, 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 a breath of fresh air, I guess is the way I would say, because, I, you know, so many in the industry still are kind of like with that, you know, that wall and that kind of sense of ego and entitlement. But I don't get any of that sense from you or even the work you've done. As many accolades as you want, as much success as you guys have had. I still feel that you're doing it for, for such a great cause, even beyond the financial. Obviously, it's a business, right? You have to look after the business. But I feel like there's something more and something, again, it just feels more personal. Um, and, and all the films that I see and the things that you guys work on, again, because it's filmmaker driven, because these stories are great, because they're so well developed, and there's a personality to them, they really just naturally stand out from a financial perspective, from an awards, from how communities receive it, from a social perspective. And it's very difficult to do that, but you guys seem to do it like consistently. Well, we are trying and we can always do better though. That's that's my motto is we can always right. do better. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think the other thing to keep in mind, and we've talked about this again throughout the day, is that every project is unique, right? I think every mm. film, every piece of content has its own journey, has its own audience. And so I guess the idea what I'm trying to get to is nothing is really cookie cutter, especially in this business, in that sense. Yeah, I mean, you can have cookie cutter in terms of a story, right? And the predictability right. of the, <laughs> the ending. Um, right. But you're, you're you're right. Like it isn't cookie cutter. Like even if I think of you know the filming that we did during during COVID, it was one was done in Canada, so we had solitary in Canada. Surrounded was filmed in the U.S. in New Mexico, and Monkey Man we filmed in Indonesia. So nothing about those three regions or stories, for that matter, has been cookie cutter. Absolutely. And especially as you mentioned, you know, the last year and a half, it's been so interesting in how we've had to pivot from production and how we handle those issues, but also marketing distribution. You know, this I mentioned this before about indie filmmakers having world premieres that year got canceled. So much of that indie film world depends on the hype and the press of these major film festivals and markets. Uh, so, you know, what do you kind of foresee in the future if you had to use your crystal ball? Are we going to get back to that? Or is there going to be a new model that we haven't discovered yet in how these smaller films get out into the world? You know, I'm I'm hopeful for the industry. I think you know, it's it's if anything, this past year and a half has taught us that if we can't go to the theaters, what else? Where else can we consume content? So mm. can we do somewhat of a hybrid? Can we have a theatrical release, you know, whatever that window looks like, and then go to a platform, uh, another platform or a streamer? Um, and, and I think is, you know, also just reemphasizing is just, you know, how do we expand the lifespan of the content that we're trying to do, especially as an indie filmmaker? So I still consider ourselves having one foot in the indie filmmaker space, um, which is really, really important to us because we really want to collaborate with those individuals that haven't been given the opportunity before. Um, I wish I had a crystal ball because then, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there would be much more commercial viability for Braun. Um, right. Yeah, but I, I think that, you know, a lot of the population we have to look at is who would want to go back to the theaters, you know, given that everything is safe and, you know, the safety protocol that's, you know, taking place there as well. Um, and, and But I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, JL, as a side note, is I miss going to the festivals and watching a screening, you know, with a thousand people in the audience and, and getting their sort of reaction to things yeah. where 
sometimes you don't anticipate the emotionality. Like sometimes they are laughing at things that you didn't think were really funny. And then other times they're like sobbing. Um, and, and then depending on where you're watching it, you have much more of an enthusiastic crowd. So I'm hopeful that we'll get to, you know, back to a theatrical sort of screening or premieres and mm. uh, viewership. Um, that's, that's my real, real, real hope. Um, but I think also is that if we think about um, content in terms of portability, if people are going to be commuting, you know, by way of subway or public transportation, they can watch things on, on, um, you know, their their um, their cell phones or their iPads and things like that, where they download apps. I think uh, we also have to think about that as well as who's going to be going to the theaters, just in terms of age groups. We have to think about who's going to be consuming content, um, you know, on different mm. devices. We have to think about, you know, what you know, uh, are we wanting to see things and other mediums of some sort? Like, you know, it's 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 really hard to predict. Um, but again, and I'm I'm really optimistic that you know things will go back to where there will be some theatrical releases um, because people are just really wanting to go back and have that um, you know that theater experience with a m number of individuals and just to enjoy a film um, on a communal basis. Yeah, no, and I, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because that communal experience to me is is just as 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 important uh, sometimes because you have this story right and you have it pent up for so long and you finally get it out and the idea is not for you to share it with yourself or a couple of friends that's nice but you want to share it with an audience right and you want to yeah. see are they going to react in the ways that I think or are they going to surprise me as a filmmaker and artist. Uh, and it's it's something that obviously predates our industry. You know, when you talk about telling stories by the campfire, you know, this is this this idea of getting in a dark room by a flickering light and telling a story, you know, and seeing folks' reaction, you know, in those shadows and those moments. There's nothing like it in the world. I don't think. I agree. I agree. You can't. You can't. Like, you can't beat that experience. Yeah, absolutely. And so speaking of experiences, this will be the last part. I know we got to wrap it up soon. But is there any experience or part of the business that you haven't tried yet that you'd like to, whether it's on the creative side, the technical side, the business side? Um, you know, what 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 would you think is something that you'd like to try one day? Um, you know, whether in this business or anything else, really, I know you mentioned fashion earlier. Um, so if you had to try something, what would it be? Um, I think it's a couple of things is, you know, we are starting to dip into the gaming side of things. So that really excites me, um, you know, for, for young people in particular, where it's a learning experience. So it's not just let's watch something for the edu uh, for the entertainment part of it, but the educational part of it, I think, is really, really cool. Um, mm -hmm. I also you're right about the fashion side of things. So if I can incorporate fashion just in terms of some of the content that I'm putting out there, um, I worked with the Vancouver Community College um, uh, last year and had a wonderful time. So my motto for for um, helping individuals within the with any industry, but particularly with fashion and the film industry, is to help emerging artists, to help emerging fashion designers. So I worked with a, um, uh, a class and they had to pitch me different designs that they would later on make for me. So I ended up getting four outfits and what I wanted to do is also to promote them and their outfits um, on social media so that could help with their portfolios but also is also give them an opportunity so if I'm walking a red carpet or an event of some sort I can showcase their talent in that way so for me is you know anything that I do um, it's really important for me to really help somebody in some capacity mm. uh, obviously for, for somebody who's yearning and wanting to do so and put the hard work in because our industry, like many other industries, is you know very very difficult. And if it was easy, then everybody would be doing it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> right. It's it's not for the faint of heart. Let's just. <laughs> <laughs> I still have hair in my head, so I'm okay still. Oh, and a lot of it, gorgeous, absolutely. <laughs> you are shining, um, absolutely, Brenda. But uh, this has been such a great hour, and I wish we had more time because I could spend two hours talking about this with you. Uh, but I don't want this to be the end. I want it to be continued because I want to have the sequel at the Biltmore next year in June. Uh, yes. If you'll accept that invitation, we'd love to have you and, and be a part of the MMFM family throughout the year. Um, we would love that as well. Lifetime member. 
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. And I want to join the, uh, if there's a Braun fan club or somewhere I can sign up for that. I want to, <laughs> I want to lead the Miami chapter of that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'll sign you up. <laughs> there you go. I love it. We'll start a Facebook group. Let's do it that way. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> well, Brenda, this has been a great time. And I know that, um, you know, uh, you're going to do a few privates as well. So thank you for doing that. Uh, and, Absolutely. uh, yeah, our audience is going to transition over to the virtual Biltmore Bar, uh, where we're going to have a Zoom version of our normal Biltmore Happy Hour networking event uh, as well, which is a lot of fun for the audience members. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the talk will be about what we just talked about as well. So be excited to join in on that in a few minutes as well. Well, thank you, JL, and, and to Miami Media Film Market. I mean, it's just been such a pleasure being here. and being asked to do something like this. And um, I look forward to our continued conversations and thank you to everybody out there that wanted to listen to what I had to say. Oh yes, absolutely. So yeah, thank, thank you again, Brenda. This was an awesome hour uh, of, of talking about the industry and about life and about making movies and it just makes me happy. <laughs> and I think that it makes the audience happy and, and this was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome, all righty, um, let's do this. Uh, so Brenda is going to make her way to the private meeting area soon, and we'll give her details of that. I want to thank my entire audience, uh, our entire uh, group here at MMFM. This is a team effort. Uh, again, uh, the, the co-founder and executive producer, Patty Arias, who does such a great job, uh, the whole team at Chemical, Miami-Dade County, who's such a great sponsor, uh, the GMCVB, uh, King Events, Stage 10, all the amazing folks uh, who helped put this together, uh, Miami Oportunidad, our web design team, uh, Amber, who's been doing such a great job coordinating all day uh, with all these meetings and everything else that's going on, the whole team at Chemical, Joe Chi, the president. Uh, you know, there's so many people to thank. And uh, again, this is, this is a family, this is a community, and this is only the end of day one. So tomorrow, uh, we're gonna start right up again at nine o'clock Eastern time uh, with a whole series of panels for day two. Uh, but right now, uh, unless you have a private meeting scheduled, uh, I say just go and click on the virtual Biltmore bar and we're gonna have a fun virtual happy hour. We're gonna talk all about the day's events. That's a great networking opportunity for all of our participants to hang out with each other, uh, to chill, talk movies, talk content, whatever you want. Uh, and then we will see you back here in the main stage at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, so I wanna thank also, this is super important, our host committee led by our chair, person Sandy Leiterman, uh, who is the chairperson of uh, Film Miami and the Miami-Dade County Film Commission, uh, and all of our committee members uh, who have done such a great job in organizing this uh, virtual event, even though we've been doing this for 10 or 11 years, actually, this is our first full virtual conference. So it's been quite the undertaking and we could not have done it with all of you together as a team, as a family, so excited for day two. So go have some virtual happy hour. Uh, get your private meetings done, get some business done, get your stories out there, do your pitches. Like Brenda said, it's all about the four P's, so make that happen as well. Uh, and we'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. sharp for day two of MMFM 11. And I think that's all I have to say for today, so we will see you tomorrow. Have a good night. <laughs>